I have some concerns with immune boosting things, right? Yeah, I, I just don't like the false sense of security that we get sometimes. Now, I fully understand that a lot of us are trying to do what we can to bolster our immune system, and I totally get that. But I don't like having a false sense of security, saying that taking one particular thing or one particular antioxidant is going to have this overarching effect on your immune system. We're born with our immune system. Okay, all we have to do is make sure that we're giving it the tools that it needs so that it doesn't become deficient in things. Deficiency is what will compromise our immune system. We're not necessarily going to heighten it and boost it. So I've got a few things that you can integrate into your daily life. Okay, nothing crazy exciting, but I will tell you, if you compile all these things, it could be pretty crazy exciting. Yeah, I do want to ask you to hit the red subscribe button, and then after you hit that red subscribe button, there's a bell icon. And if you hit that bell icon, you select all notifications, you'll get a little ding every single time that I post a new video, which is just about every single day these days. All right, so let's talk about some stuff that was published out of the Pfluger's archive. Okay, this is really cool stuff, and it talks about the relationship with sleep in the immune system. And before you tune me out and say, oh my gosh, I already know sleep is good. Don't tell me to sleep more. Just trust me, you're going to want to hear this science. It's pretty cool. Okay, so when we're sleeping, we have a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's kind of the opposite of what people would typically think. We have a pro-inflammatory system that responds, meaning we're having more inflammation while we are sleeping, right? And the reason this is happening is because we're in a restorative mode. It doesn't mean that our immune system is necessarily working harder or working more. It just means that we're restoring. And then during the day, we're actually more anti-inflammatory. We tend to think the opposite. We tend to think that inflammation goes down at night because we're recovering. It's the opposite. Anyhow, I digress. The Journal of Experimental Medicine published an interesting paper, and it took a look at how immune cells really work. And I think you're going to be fascinated by this. So immune cells have what's called an immunological synapse. This immunological synapse is like a cellular handshake. So envision this. Uh, a pathogen comes in, virus, whatever. Okay, it comes in and it binds to a cell within, let's just, again, say your respiratory system. Okay? It binds to that cell. And when that virus enters that cell, it releases a peptide. Okay, it's, so this peptide is just sort of a little signaling device for the rest of the body to know, hey, <laughs> hey, pathogen's here. Okay? Well, basically, we have these T cells in our immune system that have receptors for given peptides. Okay, this is where our adaptive immune system comes in handy. They recognize that peptide, so they know to go straight to it. They go, aha, I see that little tail of that enemy. I know he's there. Okay, so the T cell goes in, but then what it does is it binds to the cell. It doesn't bind to the virus, it binds to the cell. Okay, and this binding is that immunological synapse. So what happens is it glues to it. It glues to it, and this is what we call sort of a cellular handshake. The reason I call it a cellular handshake is because, quite honestly, it's like the first time that the immune system meets the pathogen. It's like you're sitting at the table with the enemy, across the table, and you reach over and you shake their hand. But instead of letting go of the handshake, you hold on to their hand and you pull them across the table and you neutralize them, right? That's what's going on. Well, the neutralizing comes in with something called perforin. Okay, so the T cells release something called perforin, which drills holes into the immune cell to ultimately trigger what's called cell apoptosis. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why do you, you're going to kill a cell? Yeah, you have to kill a cell. Okay, if a virus or a pathogen infects a cell, you have to get rid of the cell because if they're RNA dependent, then that means that they're going to use the cell to replicate and basically allow the pathogen to take over the body. So unfortunately, you have to just annihilate the entire house. It's the only way that you can really get rid of it. Anyhow, where am I getting at with sleep at this? Okay, well the glue, when the T cell goes in and shakes the hand, the glue that's on the hand is something called integrin. It turns out that sleeping has been demonstrated to increase levels of integrin, meaning you're going to have more of that glue, meaning the chance of the pathogen slipping away and going undetected or not binding is much, much higher. So you need to sleep. But to make matters even more interesting. When you're fasting or anything like that, you have increased levels of epinephrine or norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine decrease the amount of integrin. They get rid of the glue. So you know how I've talked about how fasting is actually not short-term good for your immune system? Well, this is one of the reasons why. I still like fasting, but again, when you're focused on the best immune system possible, you need to take it in moderation. Okay, that was long-winded. Let's talk about exercise for just a second, because this is really wild. The Journal of Strength and Conditioning took a look at high intensity interval training versus continuous circuit training. Okay, high intensity interval training being like 30 seconds on and like 60 seconds off. 30 seconds on 60, with high intensity. Well, they found that HIT ended up decreasing the number of leukocytes, monocytes, uh, neutrophils, lymphocytes, basically our white blood cells in our immune system. They decreased those numbers pretty dramatically. 
But when subjects did 25 minutes of continuous uh, circuit training at 75% of their aerobic capacity, they had an increase in those same four immune system pieces, right? Okay, so a big increase too. So what we're looking at here is the science demonstrates that when you're doing any kind of high intensity work, you're going to be immunocompromised. So again, it's not about just training like a complete weakling, it's about periodically making sure that you give yourself adequate rest so your immune system can do its job. It's selective. It has to be able to focus on one thing at a time. And the reason is usually because of something called glutamine. Now there's a lot of different reasons, but I want to focus on glutamine today. Glutamine is an amino acid, and glutamine is very, very important to fuel the immune cells. We need glutamine to ultimately help mobilize the immune system, but also allow cytokines to be released that are going to allow the proper communication. Well, it's been demonstrated in a few studies that low levels of glutamine decrease the proliferation of immune cells, mainly because it's a fuel to mobilize them. Well, when we're doing any kind of high intensity anaerobic activity, we have a decrease in glutamine stores. Now, I remember back from the days when I was you know, trying to put on a bunch of muscle and stuff like that, I used to read in some of the more complex muscle building journals that you should supplement with glutamine after a workout. And I didn't really understand why, but now it all starts to make sense. When you are done with a workout, your glutamine stores are lower. And if you supplement with glutamine, which I'm not necessarily suggesting, you could potentially get those stores back up. Now, this isn't necessarily about supplementing glutamine, not at all. I don't know if that's necessarily the answer. The point is, when you do lower intensity work or you allow your body to recover, those glutamine stores don't drain as low. So there's a period of time after your workout where you're pretty immunocompromised. So you just have to make a judgment call. If you're more worried about getting sick and you think that the overall delta and the effect on your training is going to be worse if you get sick than if you just back off your training a little bit, then, I don't know, you just need to weigh that out yourself. Okay, now we need to jump over to nutrition for a little bit. And I know you're on this channel because this is a nutrition channel. So let's focus on this just a little bit more. All right, big picture. It's all about balance. And I know that this is lame for you to hear. And I hate to be the Eeyore and kind of the you know, negative Nelly here, but the realistic thing is, yes, you have to have some balance. And I don't care whether you're keto, paleo, fasting, whatever. Okay, the fats are going to be important here. Vitamin A, vitamin E, in conjunction with vitamin D, which is really a hormone, not a vitamin, but it obviously works along with fats. Here's the thing, vitamin A deficiency has been demonstrated to affect our gut mucosal layer. If our gut mucosal layer is compromised, we have the potential of what are called lipopolysaccharides to get out of the gut and into the bloodstream, causing a low-grade chronic inflammation. A low-grade chronic inflammation means that your body is preoccupied with that chronic inflammation and doesn't have the opportunity to neutralize what it needs to neutralize as an invading pathogen. Okay? That's just one issue. The other thing we have to look at is vitamin A deficiency has been linked to a lower level of natural killer cells. This is our innate immune system. This is our immune system that is the first just explosive reaction when our body notices something is wrong. Okay? If we can't have that happen, then T cells never get a chance to do their job and have the localized attack to begin with. It's like our first line of defense to have this big explosion, big, big explosion of inflammation. You ever notice when symptoms come on like ba-boom, that's your NK cells doing their job. But the reason I'm tying vitamin D in with this is because a lot of us know that vitamin D is pretty important when it comes down to signaling the immune system. We know that. But vitamin A and vitamin D tend to go hand in hand. And vitamin D allows the immune cells to produce the different peptides that they need to produce to neutralize things. So the big one being hydrogen peroxide. Part of the process of the immune system is producing hydrogen peroxide to essentially neutralize, stabilize, and excrete a pathogen. Without the hydrogen peroxide, we don't have as good of a system going on, and vitamin D is required, or at least shown to be required, to do that. So vitamin A and vitamin D go hand in hand with things like fatty fish, or with uh, organ meats, or with uh, even darker, fattier cuts of meat now and then. Point is, eating the higher fat, healthy foods could be very, very good. Then vitamin E increases the synapses. Vitamin E increases the ability of that glue to do its job and for the immune system to be able to communicate, especially in elderly people. So people that are older really do need the vitamin E, but they need it from a whole food form. I don't necessarily recommend supplementing vitamin E. So what this could look like is having a fatty cut of salmon or something like that, along with a little slice of avocado on the top. You may be thinking it just looks like a balanced high fat meal, but the reality is, it's actually a very immune stabilizing blend of fats, antioxidants, vitamins, and ultimately, well, vitamin D, which is more of a hormone.
For what it's worth, I will put a link down to Thrive Market down below in the description. Okay, Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store. And the reason that I mention this is not only because they're a huge supporter and sponsor of this channel, but because it's very relevant. Okay, I've been able to create specific bundles within Thrive Market, whether it be for fasting, for keto, for uh, thyroid support, things like that. The point is, it's like going grocery shopping with me. So if you want some of the foods that I'm talking about or some of the foods that I would recommend, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you check them out down below in the description. It's super easy, allows you to get your groceries delivered right to your doorstep so you don't have to go to the grocery store. Super, super cool. And again, there's special setups for those of you that are watching my channel and for those of you that watch these videos. So highly recommend you check them out and thank you Thrive Market for making this channel possible. Okay, the last but one of the most important things that I do want people to be aware of is are you getting zinc in from your diet? Now, zinc supplementation is fine, but generally speaking, like 40, 50 milligrams of zinc tends to be like the upper tolerable intake, so it's better to get it from food. But here's what's wild. Okay, zinc doesn't just modulate the immune system, it doesn't just modulate inflammation. It has a pretty specific effect when it comes down to perforin. Remember the little uh, piece that drills holes in the cells in order to ultimately kill it to get you healthy again? Well, listen up. The American Journal of Physiology published a study that demonstrated that when you have a deficiency in zinc, which by the way is about 40% of elderly people and 12% of just normal adults, okay, you have a decrease in what is called interleukin-2. Interleukin-2 is a cytokine that allows the production of that perforin. Okay, it's like basically pulling the plug on a drill manufacturer. If you need a drill to drill into the cell to ultimately kill the cell and you can't produce the drill, well, then you're not gonna have a drill, right? So you gotta plug that drill manufacturer back in, okay? So that's what's happening when we're deficient in zinc. Now there's a multitude of different things we could talk about with zinc, but realistically, you should be getting it from as many whole foods as possible. So again, we come right back to the higher fat nuts, the higher fat seeds that also coincidentally have a lot of vitamin E. So you're probably seeing a pattern here, eating the higher fat foods that are healthy polyunsaturated, monounsaturated fats, could be one of the many keys to really keeping your immune system as stabilized and optimal as it should be. So as always, please do keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.